right, welcome into Surviving Paradise, the podcast that takes a sometimes serious, oftentimes humorous look at the claim by Jehovah's Witnesses that they are living in a modern day spiritual paradise. I am your host, Stacey Bauman, former elder, ministerial servant, most important to me, a kid raised as one of Jehovah's Witnesses throughout the 70s and 80s. As I do, a quick warning, we try to have fun here. We're trying to heal. We laugh. We cry. There's irreverent humor. There's sarcasm. Please know it is never meant to offend strictly my own observations, experiences, and personal insanity. All right. Welcome into Paradise this week. I want to talk about something that has intrigued me for a long, long time in life. I want to talk about secrets. Secrets are really fascinating things to me. Who doesn't love a good secret? If someone tells you that they know something that you don't know, the brain goes into hyperdrive and curiosity is almost overwhelming, at least in, is for me. <laughs> Full confession there. You just tell someone that you have a secret and just watch how they turn their undivided attention to you and only you as they try to get the information out of you. It's, it's truly human nature. It's an unbelievable circumstance of curiosity. There's so much power in secrets. And I think it goes without saying that secrets are oftentimes shrouded in mystery and they give the person who is in possession of the secret a certain amount of control, of power. And when considering the power that comes with organized secrecy, there's always been a quote that jumped out at me. It comes to us from the former president of the United States, a guy known as Woodrow Wilson, when he said the following that I think is appropriate for this conversation. He said, quote, government ought to be all outside and no inside. Everybody knows that corruption thrives in secret places and avoids public places. And we believe it is a fair presumption that secrecy means impropriety, end quote. I can't think of a quote that jumps into mind or jumps to mind more appropriate that, than that one when discussing secrets, proprietary information, power, and ultimately corruption. There is a lot that goes into the power of a secret. And during my exit from Jehovah's Witnesses, I got to tell you, and I know I'm not alone in this experience, I stumbled on many, many secrets. With each new discovery, I wondered how many other Jehovah's Witnesses knew this stuff. I had been one my entire life, and I didn't know 90% of it. And I'm not in the least bit embarrassed at this point to share that, despite the fact that it is... Uh, pretty humiliating by definition. I didn't know any of this. I found myself wondering how many have ever considered the relationship between Jehovah's Witnesses and secrets. I'm not going to go into your classic public talk format. I know that that still bleeds through sometimes and do a deep dive on something like the sacred secret or Jehovah's, uh, well, that's not true. The sacred secret. We'll leave it at that. There is something far more interesting to consider when it comes to Jehovah, his son, and ultimately the organization they're running under the leadership of nine guys in upstate New York. Call it a random thought or reach, but I don't really think it qualifies as a reach. Despite the weird look you would likely get from an everyday Jehovah's Witnesses, secrets are a way of life in God's only true organization. Why do we care? Why do I care? Why do I want to talk about it? Ultimately, it's because they claim that they do not keep secrets. And one would think that when your sole purpose is saving, saving excuse me, every living thing, on planet Earth, you would be very, very transparent about everything. What would the purveyors of all things pure truth have to hide after all? The answer, according to them, is nothing. 
Does that surprise you? A quote that lives in infamy from the Watchtower of June 1st, 1997, page 6. We'll call it our episode text, kind of like a yearly text. See what I did there? It makes this comment, quote, True religion in no way practices secretiveness, end quote. And there it is, in print. The one and only true religion in the universe claims to have no secrets. They're an open book. They're completely transparent. After all, when you alone possess universal truth, there is nothing to hide. Truth truly abolishes secrets. Why would you ever want to hide anything that is associated with the only source or path to salvation known to man. Jesus himself commented on this, and he had it recorded uh, for Jehovah's Witnesses, incidentally, in his book known as the Bible. At Mark chapter 4, verses 21 through 22, using the New World Translation, for comfort purposes, we are told this, quote, He also said to them, A lamp is not brought out to be put under a basket or under a bed, is it? Is it not brought out to be put on a lampstand? For there is nothing hidden that will not be exposed. Nothing is carefully concealed that will not come out in the open. End quote from Jesus Christ. Secrets, according to him, are only secrets for eh, maybe a short time. The inspired book of God says that they will always be exposed eventually. And why wouldn't Jehovah's chosen guys want it that way anyway? Isn't that why they call their religion the truth? But it begs the question that with so much effort put in by these guys, the Bible, Jehovah, the, the universal organization to say that true religion doesn't keep secrets, does the leadership of Jehovah's Witnesses by extension, again, the entire religion all the way to the top, have any, uh, secrets? <laughs> Wait, doesn't the Bible itself talk about secrets and stuff? Yeah. And so the paradox and blatant dishonesty begins. And that is why this subject is so incredibly fascinating to me on many different levels, but we'll focus in on these. It's not hard to see why secrets are a way of life for Jehovah's Witnesses. Anyone that's been one gets it. It starts at the top. Jehovah himself is a very secretive God, as taught to the rest of us by the governing body. And his book, The Bible, allegedly written for the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses, is itself a book containing many, you guessed it, secrets. And considering the good book says we were made in Jehovah's image, it's not hard to see why we all, as human beings, love a good secret. We were made in his image. Jehovah himself, as we will come to see, loves a good secret and loves to keep secrets. An example, at Deuteronomy 29, 29 of the New World Translation, we are told, quote, the things concealed belong to Jehovah, our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our descendants forever, so that we may carry out all the words of this law. End quote. There you have it. There are some things concealed. Jehovah is a God of secrets. And again, I'm not going to go deep into secret secrets and a whole bunch of other applications one can make to this. We're going to stay focused. At least I'm going to try to. You know that's an issue for me. We all know what it feels like. Someone tells you, hey, hey, I have a secret, and now you have to hear it. Where did that start? Where did that entire dynamic start? As we've come to learn and will, apparently, that started with the Almighty Himself. <laughs> Jehovah has some things He just isn't sharing with us, but He wanted to be sure that we knew that He has some secrets. He's got lots of secrets. After creating man and giving him natural curiosity in his image, 
for example, see how a couple of naked people uh, were put in front of a beautiful tree with fruit, and then he told them that they couldn't have any of that fruit. He also put it in his instructions to mankind, the Bible itself, his success manual, that he has secrets. But not only does Jehovah have secrets, but did you know that when it comes to all things secrecy as an organization, that it starts at the top with how Jehovah is also watching you in secret. <laughs> Are you uncomfortable? I've heard from a few people that that's not exactly a warm and fuzzy observation. From Matthew chapter 6 and verse 6 of the New World Translation, we're told, quote, Pray to your Father who is in secret, then your Father who looks on in secret will repay you. End quote. Nothing uncomfortable here. So far, we've established Jehovah has secrets. Uh, he knows that we're made in his image, and he knows that that will probably drive us nuts as our curiosity will get the best of it. But he also wants us to know that he watches us in secret. It's highly comfortable, isn't it? As a kid, I used to wonder if Jehovah was secretly watching me on the toilet. Not gonna kid, not even kidding about that. Is he watching me right now? <laughs> and if so, why? likely watching or, or like why is he watching this all secretly is is that okay why does he even want to do that we have a word for that when another person does it but again he made us so he can watch us all in secret it's okay from where he sits does he not have anything better to do than to watch me in secret was he interrupted in, from creating another black hole to secretly watch me watching an R-rated movie in secret? Satan is running around killing people, and he's having movies like The Exorcist made, but he wants to secretly watch me cheat on my math test? I don't get it. I'm now in my 50s, and I don't get it, but there it is. Jehovah secretly, while contemplating his own secrets, watches the rest of us. Think about that as you make a move on that someone special tonight. <laughs> He's watching secretly. But this always threw me for a loop. Does Jehovah just secretly watch us and repay the bad stuff? Can I get an extra scoop of ice cream if I made two more return visits this month? Oh yeah, my childlike brain is still very attached to how Jehovah watches us all in secret. But there it is. He wanted to let us know, which of course starts quite a conundrum. Is it really a secret if he tells us he's watching us in secret? I don't know. Listen, clearly I needed therapy as a kid. I mean, what, what, huh? So much confusion. But it's not all bad. Jehovah himself may have some secrets. For example, he never hated beards. He just let us think so for almost 100 years. He always thought they were just fine, even as he watched us shave them off. Because, well, at that time, apparently it was a secret. <laughs> it was a secret that he didn't mind beards. But eventually, after watching us all squirm for decades, he decides to let us in on the secret a few weeks ago. And now Jehovah's Witnesses can have beards. Just a small and more recent example of Jehovah, the keeper of secrets, who's watching on in secret. But we're told this. To extend this thought at Daniel chapter 2 and verse 28 of the New World Translation, where it says, quote, There exists a God in the heavens who is a revealer of secrets. End quote. Well, that just got interesting. And there it is. As the source of true wisdom, Jehovah eventually reveals some of his secrets to the rest of us. Incidentally, he now does this, as we are told, by means of nine guys in upstate New York. They run the only true religion known as Jehovah's Witnesses, allegedly. Jehovah can keep a secret for centuries. Then, when he feels like it's the right time, he does something like marches Stephen Lett onto JW Broadcasting, where he shares some of his really cool secrets with the rest of us here on planet Earth. Imagine secretly telling people, they had to be a Jehovah's Witness before the Great Tribulation, only to roll out, hey, psych, I'll let you in on a secret. You can now decide my guys are the best during the Great Tribulation. 
rendering all the sacrifices a Jehovah's Witness is currently making completely useless, since you can now skip it all until the earthquakes roll in and fire is flying around in the sky. Pretty cool secret, huh? I got you, didn't I? <laughs> and there you have it, and it's undeniable how the God of secrets who watches on in secret apparently begins to share secrets with us. He told us he'd do that in the Bible, but he's doing it through these nine guys, and his secrets are, uh, they're ball busters. I mean, they really shake things up. Jehovah is a keeper of secrets, despite his guys saying true religion has no secrecy. What a strange paradox this all is. But it's in print. I read it to you. June 1st, 87. Nowhere is the power of a secret more evident than in watching the Almighty keep secrets that get people killed among Jehovah's Witnesses, only to decide he wants to let us all in on it by rolling out some, uh, wait for it, they call it new light, otherwise known as sharing a big secret. That's all it really was. That's all it was all along. If you want to learn how to keep a secret, look no further than the top of this organization. Look no further than Jehovah himself. His nine guys in New York have really given us some insight into how important it is to keep a good secret. And that's going to get worse as this episode goes along. But how about a couple more examples of Jehovah keeping secrets that I personally think are worth mentioning for a Jehovah's Witness that might have accidentally wandered into this podcast. Who can forget that time Jehovah and his son kept living in paradise on an earth forever secret until he whispered it into the ears of Judge Joe Rutherford in uh, the late date of 1932? That was a big one. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that secret you kept uh, completely veiled for multiple centuries. It's not even in the book. In fact, that might be the best secret Jehovah ever kept because it isn't even mentioned or hinted at in the Bible. But wait, I think I have one more to land the point home, one that made trumpet. He is still sitting on what I would consider a massive secret. He still has not told anyone in 2024 when he plans on killing all the rest of us, including Satan himself. That is still a big secret. Brought to you from Mark chapter 13 and verse 32 of the New World Translation, where he tells us, quote, Concerning that day or the hour, nobody knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son but the Father, end quote. At the time of that inspired comment, Jehovah was even keeping secrets from Jesus, his own son. You got to admit, that's wild stuff. He didn't even want the king of Jehovah's Witnesses to even know when he himself would be sent on a white horse to kill everyone that wasn't a baptized Jehovah's Witness. We can only imagine Jesus might know now, but we have no confirmation. It might still be a secret. It's 2024. And it really shows the type of secret keeper Jehovah is. Not even the guy he sent to ransom the rest of us is in on all of the secrets. It's truly incredible if you just sit and think about it for a few minutes. I can't imagine I'm the only one. If not, I should be more embarrassed. But it doesn't stop there. The Bible itself is a book of secrets, and it has a lot to say about all things secrets. Borrowing from the governing body's playbook on using an ancient person who we aren't even sure ever existed or in the least is probably very much embellished or become a legend, consider Queen Esther. You'll find her in her book in the Bible, the Hebrew Scriptures. Despite the apparent historical difficulties, the internal inconsistencies of the book, the pronounced symmetry of themes and events, the plenitude of quoted dialogue, and the gross exaggeration in the reporting of numbers involving time, money, and people that are found in the book, 
all pointing to Esther as a work of fiction, including its vivid characters, except for Xerxes. We know he's around. There's some tablets and museums on him. All of it very likely being the product of the author's wild imagination. Put all of that aside. Because there's actually a little tidbit in the story of Queen Esther about secrets that Jehovah apparently wanted recorded so that the rest of us would know. In Esther chapter 2, verses 21 through 23 of the New World Translation, we get a pretty big moment in Jewish history. Quote, In those days, while Mordecai was sitting in the king's gate, Bigthan and Teresh, two court officials of the king, doorkeepers, got angry and plotted to do away with King Ahasuerus. But Mordecai learned about it, and he immediately told Queen Esther. Not a good secret keeper, that Mordecai. Back to the quote in the account. Esther then spoke to the king in Mordecai's name. This could qualify as gossip, but you'll see why not soon. Back to the quote. So the matter was investigated and eventually confirmed. And both men were hanged on a stake. And this was all recorded in the book of the history of the times in the presence of the king, end quote. The inspired book of Esther. And a whole, eh, almost incredible flash into the mindset of all things secrets as it pertains to Jehovah, good, bad, ugly, good ones, bad ones, you name it. And I want to encourage you to keep that story in mind. We know that that story impacted uh, the Jewish faith, the Jewish culture to a tremendous degree, um, as told by the Bible itself. But what I really want to focus on is how secrets, and when it comes to people's lives being on the line, those shouldn't be secrets at all. They should be told to someone in authority. I think you know where this is going, keep it in mind. Apparently, Jehovah is a big believer in revealing secrets if someone is in danger, as demonstrated by that story, and will go so far as to, I don't know, administer capital punishment and hang people on stakes to protect innocent people from being harmed. And isn't that something? He had it recorded for the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses who claim that the Bible was written for them, and by extension, the religion that they lead. So we all know how Jehovah feels about secrets and how to handle secrets that get people hurt or killed. If that is the case, secrecy as a dynamic goes out the window and someone should always be alerted to the incoming danger. It looks like the Nine Kings may have missed the memo on this story, and that's the reason I dropped it into this conversation. But keep it in mind or in the back of your head as we continue the conversation. You could say that the Bible continues in its conversation and its teachings on secrecy. The book of Proverbs, in particular, if you shine a light on it, has a lot to say about secrets, including how to be a good secret keeper. See Proverbs chapter 11, if you want to learn how to do that. What it means to take a bribe in secret. See chapter 17, if that applies to you. And then back to Psalms, the book that we call its next door neighbor and a big one where he reminds us in chapter 101 that if you slander someone in secret, Jehovah heard it. But the real question in all of this insanity is why is any of this interesting if you're a Jehovah's Witness in 2024? Because again, the nine guys in New York tell us the following, and I got marked good on repetition for emphasis. From the Watchtower of June 1st, 1997, to re-emphasize and quote the quote at the outset of this episode, they say, true religion in no way practices secretiveness. And it's just a phenomenal statement. And let's face it, it's a paradox on so many levels, considering that Jehovah and his book are all about a good secret. So is that just a lie when they make a quote like that? Not to worry. If you don't already know, and despite that bold statement, you're about to learn that the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses are themselves all about 
keeping secrets. <laughs> I know that doesn't shock many of us. And now for some examples. And I'm going to start with the mundane and comical, and I'm going to swiftly move into proof that is painfully serious. For anyone that was part of this religion in the 1980s through the 2000s, the only two words you may have heard more than Jehovah's Witnesses might have been United Nations. <laughs> and again, for the generation that grew up around this and was peppered with it, you know what I speak of. The United Nations was an international organization that was supposed to usher in peace on the earth, and boy, did they leverage that whole part of it, and was founded in 1945. It's currently made up of 193 member states and countries, and according to the governing body, is depicted in Revelation chapter 17 as a scarlet-colored wild beast with seven heads and two horns. Oh, yeah. The subject of so many watchtower studies, I can't even possibly name them all. No one can even count them. It was so redundant, it would give you a migraine. The endless diatribe from the governing body against the United Nations and this beast in every book, every article, every special talk outline. The organization known as the United Nations led by Satan the devil himself. In fact, who can forget the Watchtower of 1987, September 1st, pages 18 through 23 in the article On Guard Against Peace and Security as Devised by the Nations. We get this quote from the governing body. The United Nations is actually a world confederacy against Jehovah God and his dedicated witnesses on earth. It is really a conspiracy with the worldly nations getting their heads together and scheming up what they may do against the visible organization of Jehovah God on earth, end quote. That's right. It was a conspiracy against Jehovah. When the purveyors and the builders of the United Nations and all those politicians built that organization, they knew full well they were fighting Jehovah God and they were going to take it out on his people, Jehovah's Witnesses, at the time located right across the river in New York with a whole bunch of factories pumping out publications. They were deeply concerned. To even walk by the building in New York may get you hit by lightning. You remember if you were there. If the YMC, YMCA, I should say, was, was evil or your local church was a terrible place to be caught, then the United Nations and its building were Satan's private nightclub. This comment is from 1987. So imagine when it was discovered that the governing body, they had a little secret. Their organization, the only true organization, true religion doesn't operate in secrecy, their comment, not mine, had actually applied for NGO membership within the United Nations in 1991, four years after saying it was a conspiracy against Jehovah. They were accepted, and very few witnesses know this because it was a secret in 1992, and it was all a secret to Jehovah's Witnesses, and I mean all of them, until it became public in an investigative article in the Guardian newspaper on October 8, 2001, when they blew the lid off the governing body's secret. And once this secret was discovered, of course, they rallied, and literally within days, the organization had withdrawn their membership. One can only wonder, how long the secret would have lasted had a reporter not outed them in that article? Would it still be a secret among Jehovah's Witnesses today if no one knew? And didn't they say there were no in secrets inside true religion? I got to tell you, candidly, this particular revelation was a wake-up call for a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses. And it should have been. For an organization that claims it doesn't keep secrets, but the God they worship loves secrets, only to be found they were sleeping with the enemy, well, it's all a little confusing, and it's sure as hell troubling, isn't it? For any of us that lived through this time period, the secret 
once revealed that this organization was cavorting with the United Nations, blew people away. And a lot of people left the organization over this. And like I said, it's one of the more mundane ones. The secrets don't stop there. Consider what is likely, in my opinion, one of the most polarizing secrets the governing body has ever created. It's this little thing most people refer to as the Elder's Secret Handbook, otherwise known as the Shepherd, the Flock of God book, given to any men who are appointed to care for his precious sheep. I know. Many are saying, well, ah, look, Stacy, that isn't much of a secret anymore. You're right. The internet has certainly made that true. Not much of a secret. You can get your own copy. You can download it these days. But that wasn't always the case starting back in 1977 with the first one. The motive and instructions regarding this book were always, from the outset, intended to be a secret. And as I mentioned, they've had several renditions of that book going back to 77. And listen, with that book came the instructions that this is for the elders only. They weren't even allowed to leave this laying out on their desk for, their, for fear that their wives may see the secret book. It was unbelievable. Prior to the 2010 edition of this secret book for elders was released, each congregation was sent a letter to specifically to the body of elders. It was dated October 23rd, 2010. And it was very clear in stating that only elders can view, see, or even know of its existence. From the letter itself, quote, the information is designed for use by the elders only and other individuals should not have any opportunity to read the information. End quote. And I have to tell you, when I became an elder at the very young age in my mid-20s, one of the things I was most excited about was getting my secret book. Because at that point, I knew that one existed, had no idea what it was called, what it looked like, or what was inside of it. Let me tell you, massive letdown. <laughs> but for decades, the governing body has regularly released a letter to elders or announcements and reminders with a section for the elders only, for their eyes only, and a section separately sent to them that is going to be read to the rest of the flock. Instantaneously, you've got secrets. In announcement and reminders of January 2021, the elders section announced a revised edition for April 2021 and told the elders to be on lookout for their new improved secret book. It was so secret that, as it says, it would be specially wrapped to keep it all secret from anyone that might see it. Section 3 of the January 2021 announcement includes the following comment, quote, The books will be wrapped to ensure confidentiality and will be labeled for delivery to the coordinator of the body of elders, end quote. If you're sitting back right now and going, I, I got to give this a second. I need to think about this for a minute. You might remember that Jesus himself gave the apostles a secret book and instructed them that they couldn't share it with anyone, right? You, you don't remember that verse, that story in the Bible? Yeah, I don't either. Even more insulting about these secret books that are now not secret at all, as I mentioned, is the contents of them, which are mostly secular procedures, including everything from building maintenance and kingdom halls to how to take people's money the right way. <laughs> but regardless, a secret book that must be adhered to and obeyed by any and every Jehovah's Witness who has been baptized. Imagine that. You're, dedicate, you're, you're someone who's dedicated your life to Jehovah only to find out that Jehovah, well, he kind of moved the ball and he changed and changes the rules. There's a secret book with all sorts of secret information that the elders can use to make decisions about your life. And you can't even know what's inside of it. You can't see it. You can't read it. I got to tell you, the first time I got this book and when I really contemplated all the 
all the power that comes with such a secret book, it, it really gave all new meaning to that whole, hey, look over there, there's a body of water. What prevents me from getting baptized? As stated by the Ethiopian eunuch. And I got to tell you, I thought, uh, I don't know. How about a secret book with secret things they can do to me once I get baptized? <laughs> maybe that, maybe that's preventing me from getting baptized. <laughs> you don't say. <laughs> but again, the irony, whether you laugh at it or you actually consider it to be serious, which I do, is that true religion isn't one built secretively. It isn't ruled by the God of secrets who doesn't need to keep secrets. It's just a migraine headache. It's what happens when dishonesty is injected into any structure of authority. But of course, the secret, not so secret books, buried treasure, all surrounds what many Jehovah's Witnesses consider the most mysterious secretive arrangement this side of how the hell Stephen Lett was ever appointed. And that arrangement is judicial meetings. It's this book that lays the groundwork in secret for what judicial meetings entail for Jehovah's Witnesses. You literally may have no idea what's going to happen in that room until you've already done something wrong, your life is a mess, you're an emotional train wreck, and you enter the room. You might have no idea what's coming. And that's because it's all outlined in this book. The entire judicial meeting format is shrouded in secrecy. Once someone's sin is brought to the elders, they retreat into a private room to discuss uh, your secrets. <laughs> That's right. They're in secret discussing your secrets. They then begin a process of secrecy, including who gets to serve on the three-man committee, who's the chairperson. And don't forget that they're told to reference, you guessed it, the secret elder's handbook when dealing with your pain, misery, and future, not the Bible. From the secret handbook, chapter 15, subheading number four, an elder who gets his secret book reads this, quote, each time an elder serves on a judicial committee, he should first review God's word, the Bible. Oh, I'm sorry, that's not correct. Back to the quote. He should first review chapters 12, 15, and 16 of this publication. End quote. You remember, like Jesus told the apostles to do. Please note, the sinner on trial for their life in many situations has no access to the secret book and has no clue what it says. However, the shepherds, holding their life in the palm of their hands, their future relationships with their family, perhaps a mate, a child, those guys are told to review the secret book. Behold, the true religion that doesn't operate in secrecy from the June 1st, 1987 Watchtower. <laughs> This stuff can't be ignored. It's complete insanity. But it gets worse, especially if you're a female. Let's say someone has cheated. In the cases of adultery, you have to spill your secrets. And I've got past episodes where some of these guys like to know every detail. How many movements of your tongue, fingers, body parts, and everything else and what the end result was, trying to be careful. But get this, while the woman has to reveal every single detail, the man who may have cheated and committed adultery, well, he doesn't. And neither do the elders. They just tell her to ask him for more of the details on the crime he committed against her. From chapter 15, subheading number 14, under the titled subheading, Meeting with Marriage Mates, Adultery, we get 
this from the secret book from the not so secret organization quote furthermore they should inform the innocent mate that her resuming sexual relations with the guilty mate would negate any claim to scriptural freedom but they should not give her further details on the other hand the elders may find that while the husband did confess adultery to his wife, he did not tell her the full extent of his wrong conduct and left out important information that the wife should know. The elders should not provide this confidential information to the wife, but they can suggest that she speak with her husband again. End quote. The Secret Elders Handbook and how it impacts a woman who has just had her life completely obliterated by a cheating husband. You see, if you're a woman in Jehovah's Witnesses, this book and all its secrets highlight the fact that you don't really have any rights, including the fact that he can come to your judicial meeting, but he can refuse to let you come to his. That too is in the Secret Elders Handbook. And the elders sitting on judging you, they get to keep all the secrets close to the vest. And I got to tell you, if you're going to look into this book, there are so many more we could talk about. But how many Jehovah's Witnesses know the level to which secrecy is maintained? Consider one final example. Are you ready? Chapter 16, subheading 18, under the subheading, If the Decision is to Reprove, elders in the secret book are told this secret, quote, As soon as possible after the hearing, the Judicial Committee should fill out the record of disfellowshipping, disassociation, or judicial reproof, Form S-77, with the date of the announcement left blank. Any personal notes should be destroyed. End quote. Your secret is safe with them. <laughs> However, in case you didn't realize it, it is forever immortalized in their files back in New York. You make a mistake. You confessed. We recorded it all on some provided forms from the governing body, and we sent your secrets and the details back to New York for the service committee, some people you don't even know, to examine, read, and file away. <laughs> but oh, we do like to cover our tracks when we're unloading secrets. We will destroy our personal notes, even though we only do that to absolve ourselves from liability in the event you ever want to sue us down the road. <laughs> It is a stunning example of an ex of a organization that claims to be from Jehovah, the Almighty God, that doesn't practice secrecy. One of my favorite, favorite things highlighting the absurdity of judicial committees is when someone is privately reproved, otherwise known as, let's face it, secretly reproved. <laughs> As if your sudden silence at the Watchtower study and your inability to say a public prayer if you're a guy doesn't indicate, well, you kind of have a secret going on. The entire judicial meeting process is a study in secrecy among Jehovah's Witnesses. They would call it confidentiality, but it's truly just secrecy. Despite the Bible showing older men at the city gates judging serious wrongs for everyone to be present and witness, the Jehovah's Witness way is behind closed doors with no eyewitnesses except three strange guys. It's a star chamber. It's cloaked in secrecy. See past episodes. There's no way around it. In other words, the true religion that doesn't operate in secrecy has a lot of procedures that are, uh, secrets. But when considering the absurd world of not-so-secret secrets in God's organization, it all pales in comparison to the deeply disturbing and repugnant levels the governing body will sink to to keep secret what is happening to innocent children inside this religion. Bluntly stated, 
most Jehovah's Witnesses you encounter or bring this up to currently attending meetings in kingdom halls have no clue as to the depth these men will go to to protect their organization. All of it at the sacrifice of innocent children. Even now, I continue to be amazed at how little Jehovah's Witnesses know about this issue, despite the fact that it's plastered across newspapers and on major news websites. It's all over social media. Pick a country. Most Jehovah's Witnesses have no clue what is going on with child safety inside their true religion. And if you wonder why, I'm just going to tell you bluntly, wonder no more. The reason is this. It's all kept secret from them. Jehovah's Witnesses are warned that to even consider this subject is tantamount to apostasy and disrespecting Jehovah himself. And to me, this currently qualifies as the governing body's dirtiest, most massive secret. And it's devastating. It is devastating. There are no words for this. Anyone that's sat with someone that's been a victim of this inside Jehovah's Witnesses knows that not only do they never fully recover as they try to heal with the scars always evident, but in knowing that what they've been through leaves scars on you. Jehovah's Witnesses leadership has a mountain of vile secrets. To say it's repugnant doesn't even capture the true evil of this subject. And they will go to any length possible to keep this secret a secret. But here are some of the details we know as facts. These are facts regarding this particular secret. According to the Atlantic Magazine and Journal of April 2019, investigative journalists have uncovered one of Jehovah's most disturbing secrets. And that is his organization keeps a secret database of child predators from their congregations. And when I say from, I mean they're still sitting there, people. They're still in some of these kingdom halls. Quoting The Atlantic, currently available online, feel free to Google it, you will find this, quote, In March 1997, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, the nonprofit organization, <laughs> okay, that oversees the Jehovah's Witnesses sent a letter of its 10 to each, excuse me, must land this correctly, to each of its 10,883 U.S. congregations and to many more congregations worldwide. The organization was concerned about the legal risk posed by possible child molesters within its ranks. The letter laid out instructions on how to deal with a known predator. Write a detailed report answering 12 questions. Was this a one-time occurrence, or did the accused have a history of child molestation? Can't believe that's a question. Back to the quote, how is the accused viewed within the community? What? Does anyone else know about the abuse? And mail it to Watchtower's headquarters in a special blue envelope. Keep a copy of the report in your congregation's confidential file. The instructions continued and do not share it with anyone. End quote. I'm going to pause here. It's just, yeah. Back to the article. Quote, thus did the Jehovah's Witnesses build what might be the world's largest database of undocumented child molesters at least two decades worth of names and addresses likely numbering in the tens of thousands and detailed acts of alleged abuse, most of which have never been shared with law enforcement, all scanned and searchable in a Microsoft SharePoint file. End quote. The word secret just took on a whole new meaning. This doesn't even qualify as a secret. This qualifies as a crime, a crime against children. But the article continues, quote, 
Watchtower has faced dozens of similar lawsuits from victims who say the organization's policies enabled and protected their abusers. In addition to the 1997 special blue envelope letter, these suits have cited a 1989 letter in which the Watchtower discouraged elders from reporting wrongdoing to civil authorities. There is a time to keep quiet when your words should prove to be few. Quoting Ecclesiastes 3, 7, and 5, 2, it read, quote, Improper use of the tongue by an elder can result in serious legal problems for the individual, the congregation, and even the society. End quote. In other words, and it's undeniable, congregation elders among Jehovah's Witnesses were told that they need to keep this little secret. A secret that the religion, the governing body says doesn't keep secrets, wants them to keep. But the governing body set the tone to show elders worldwide how important it is to keep their secret. And we all learn just how much a secret is worth to the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society during that time period. In a California lawsuit also highlighted in this article from in 2016, the judge ordered the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, to pay a fine of $4,000 a day until it handed over the documents with this information, this database. Do you want to know what the governing body did in reference to their secret? They went on to rack up two million dollars in charges before eventually settling the case in February of 2018. In a move no thinking, compassionate human could possibly even remotely reason on, it took them over two years. They never gave the information and they settled. They would have rather paid money than to reveal their secret. A secret that harms children. The secret is so well kept that authorities don't know how many alleged pedophiles are named in this secret database. It has been, uh, it's been widely speculated. There was a quote from the article uh, from an unnamed elder in 2002 that said he believed the number was 23,720 perpetrators and harmers of kids. Stunning, nauseating look at how devastating this secret is for Jehovah's Witnesses. It can be found in nearly every country Jehovah's Witnesses reside, can be found. And for 8 million professed Jehovah's Witnesses, they are to believe that Jehovah and his son Jesus Christ want the governing body to keep this information. You guessed it, a secret. The same king that took children in his arms and scolded his apostles for discouraging them from coming to him, from hugging him. The, the same God that sees us as embryos and refers to us as precious that knows every hair is numbered on our heads, that speaks glowingly of children. He wants this all to be a big secret. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses today, whether they know it or not, and can you even believe, from the mundane to the deadly serious one we're landing on here, can you even believe they don't know these secrets? But without question, by association, Jehovah's Witnesses are all just part of this dirty secret kept by God's organization. And I mentioned earlier the story in the Bible uh, highlighting Esther and Mordecai and how Jehovah apparently had that entered there because uh, you never keep a secret if it means someone's going to get hurt or killed. That's why he had the whole Mordecai told Esther, Esther told the king, the king had him hung thing. But apparently the governing body doesn't grasp the story. 
It's in their Bible stories books for kids. They've talked about it. They've had dramas on it, but they don't grasp it. They don't grasp that the God of the Bible, who himself keeps secrets, he thinks we should do whatever it takes to save innocent lives and to keep people from harm. Secrets. It's really a fascinating subject and conversation in light of Jehovah's Witnesses. But I'll tell you, like everything else in our lives, secrets can be complex and far-ranging in nature, admittedly. I could sit here and go on for another hour listing many of the secret policies and the secret rules created in secret by the leadership of Jehovah's Witnesses, the vast majority of which have zero basis in the Bible. Where did they come from? Why is it such a secret? At this point, are you really sick and tired of hearing me say the word secret? <laughs> I am. I truly am. Jehovah's Witnesses claim their religion is based on that Bible. But it doesn't take a rocket scientist to pick up the Holy Book, the most widely distributed book on planet Earth, and to open that book and... Uh, from the very beginning, see that the Bible is really fairly transparent. In fact, some people would argue eh, it's almost too transparent. I didn't need to know that about the concubine and the 12 tribes, <laughs> right? But when you open the Bible, it's transparent. There's not a lot of secrets. We have a guy named Moses. He gets Ten Commandments. He walks down a hill, a mountain, and he reads those Ten Commandments to everyone. No secrets here. Even as the Mosaic Law evolved and took on hundreds of other details, don't pick up sticks, don't breathe, watch out for solar eclipses, yeah, I'm being a smartass. Uh, even as it evolved, it was still public knowledge and everyone had access to it. It wasn't a secret book. You can pick it up today. You can often find yourself dozing off as you read Deuteronomy, Leviticus, Chronicles. It's got every nitty-gritty detail. It's transparent. Then, as you move to the Greek scriptures in the Holy Book, the transparent book, we have the current king of Jehovah's Witnesses uh, in the spotlight, Jesus Christ, the four Gospels. Even after he went back to heaven, he had his apostles write letters to the congregations based on his teachings. There wasn't a law, there wasn't a principle, there wasn't a policy or a secret rule that was kept from the early Christians in the first century and beyond. You can't find one. Why? Because everything's in the book. It's transparent. There aren't secrets. And certainly upon multiple examinations of the Bible, you won't find anything he shared with mankind that could lead to us being harmed. There wasn't another secret book that was an addition. There wasn't secret practices. But folks, for anyone who's lasted through this episode, here we are in 2024 and his organization here on the earth, it's undeniable. It, it, it keeps, well, a lot of secrets, secrets that devastate people's lives. I'm reminded of a quote from Edgar Watson Howe in his book, Country Town Sayings Filled with Little Cheeky Wisdom and Thoughts. And he said it well there. He said, quote, the man who can keep a secret may be wise but he is not half as wise as the man with no secrets to keep." End quote. Isn't that profound? You can call yourselves the leader of God's visible organization, but you're a lot wiser if you don't have any secrets at all. And so it leaves me with a question. Why does a God of love build an earthwide organization that he claims doesn't keep secrets but has been as openly exposed as one that keeps horrible secrets. And where does a lead of a Jehovah's Witness on this issue of secrets in 2024? Should a witness keep the secrets? 
How does a witness view an organization that keeps secrets even from them? I got to tell you, it's a complex subject and certainly a set of emotions for anyone that has been a part of all of it. However, I have to boldly say this. The things shared in this crazy episode are no longer secrets. They're facts. Facts that either add to the proof that Jehovah's Witnesses are the only true religion on this earth or that call that claim into question. The only way to get the answer is to move through it, to consider it. It's going to be uncomfortable, and at times, it's going to be downright devastating. Many of us know exactly what it feels like to take a look at all the secrets. But the only thing to consider is what you will do with the information. Are you going to decide to help them keep it a secret? Are you one of those people that's able to turn and look away once you know the truth or the secret? Can you do that? As blunt or harsh as it may sound, if you're able to ignore all of this, including many more secrets, I have to point you to a line from what I think is an amazing book and an incredible movie. Has anyone out there seen the movie The Prestige, a book by Christopher Priest? The movie starred Hugh Jackman and Christian Bale, Scarlett Johansson, and it's about a couple of competing mu musicians, excuse me, not musicians, magicians, <laughs> excuse me. One of the supporting actors is the great Michael Caine. He plays a, cust a character, excuse me, known as Cutter in the movie. And his character says something profound that I want every Jehovah's Witness who bravely sat through some of this episode or all of this episode to consider. Cutter, played by Michael Caine, and found in the book by Christopher Priest, says this. He says, quote, Now you're looking for the secret. But you won't find it. Because, of course, you're not really looking. You don't really want to know. You want to be fooled. End quote. I want to thank you for a heavy subject matter and joining me this week. Thanks for being here. It's not a secret. I appreciate everyone being here, listening in, and your feedback. Wherever you may be, be well.